Uh, welcome to this uh, fifth meeting of the Equalities in the Human Rights Committee and this is the first meeting of the committee since our name change and our remit change and I hope you uh, enjoy the acronym we now have. The Equality and Human Rights Committee is now known as ERIC so it'll help you to remember who, who we are when we put a name on it and I think we'll be filtering everything that we do through ERIC because if it doesn't work for ERIC then it doesn't work for anyone so um, we're really looking forward to that. Can I ask you to put any electronic devices into uh, flight mode? Um, you ha I'm happy for you to use them but if you take turn off all the sound because it interfere with the broadcasting and just another wee thing on the broadcasting if you can maybe be about a foot away from your microphone but don't touch any buttons the broadcasters will do that for us because um, you might switch yourself on and they'll switch you off and then you'll switch it back on and we don't want to have that that's not not good so um uh, I'm Christina McKelvey, I'm the convener of the committee and we'll just get kicked off uh, straight away with some apologies this morning from one of our colleagues, David Torrance, um, and we have uh, Linda Fabiani here today who will be substituting for David and we're uh, lovely to have Linda here this morning. Uh, our first agenda item is a decision to take agenda items 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private and if committee members are content to do that. Agreed. Excellent. So we're moving straight on to agenda item two, which is a substantive piece of our work, which is our third round table now to look at the, the work programme for this committee, look at some of the priorities that you may have as organisations and how we can maybe take some of that through the work that, that we are doing in order to, to move things forward on this agenda. Can I thank all of you who came along for the breakfast meeting this morning? I hope you enjoyed that this morning. It just gave us a, a chance informally to get to know each other. So hopefully you'll feel a bit more relaxed and a bit more able to, to open up and tell us what we need to know what we need to hear this morning uh, formally in the committee um, and it was great to hear some of your experiences and some of the ideas that you have as well. Um, I'm just going to go around the table as I've said I've introduced myself so if we go around the table and introduce ourselves um, and don't touch the buttons please. Uh, I'm Chloe Clemens. I'm from the Scottish Church's Parliamentary Office and I'm representing um, some work about strategic planning that the Church of Scotland has been carrying out. Oh, I'm Sandra Daylon Clark, and I'm from Semper Scotland. It's a police organisation that represents all minority ethnic police officers and staff on issues of equality and race, and also ensures that Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority um, uphold the principles of race and equality. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm Lib Dem member for Edinburgh West, but I'm also vice convener of this committee. Hello everyone, I'm Maureen Sire, Director of uh, Interfaith Scotland. Hi, I'm Gozi Joadigui, I'm Senior Eye Health and Equalities Officer for RNIB Scotland. Uh, good morning everyone, I'm Tam Bailey, I'm the Children and Young Person People's Commissioner. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Jeremy Balfour, I'm an MSP for the Lovians. My name is Lorraine Cook and I sit within, I'm from Coslin, I sit within the Migration, Population and Diversity Team. I'm Keely Thorpe, I'm the Campaigns and Policy Manager at Enable Scotland, the organisation often for people who have learning disabilities in Scotland. Good morning everyone, I'm Lorraine Gillis and I'm from Audit Scotland. Good morning, I'm Annie Wells, I'm the Conservative MSP for Glasgow. I'm Anna Ritchie Allen from Close the Gap, we work on women's labour market participation. I'm Rosalind Bragg, I'm the Director of Maternity Action. We work on maternity rights, particularly in the areas of employment rights and benefits and also vulnerable migrant women. Hello, I'm Willie Coffey, MSP, SNP, constituency member for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. Brandy Lee Loftonell from LGBT Youth Scotland, the um, nation's largest youth and community-based organisation for LGBT young people. Um, good morning, I'm Suzanne Monday. I'm Chief Exec with MECOP, which is a minority ethnic carers organisation. Good morning, I'm Mary Fee, and I'm an MSP for West Scotland. Good morning, I'm Judith Robertson, I'm the Chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Good morning, my name is Glenda Watt, I'm with the Scottish Older People's Assembly. Good morning, I'm Linda Fabiani, MSP for East Kilbride. Pleased to be here. Good morning, I'm James Morton, the Manager of the Scottish Transgender Alliance. Excellent. Well, now we've all had introductions, but we'll try to conduct the, the, the round table uh, as free-flowing as possible. If, if you could just give me a nod when you want to come in. I've got a wee tick list to make sure everybody gets to, to have their say this morning. But if we just channel things through me, we'll, we'll, we'll get through much more. Um, I'm going to do a sort of a general opening question. Um, obviously, we're working on the, 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 the work programme for our committee. We have an expanded remit now. There's some new responsibilities conferred on this committee 
authority from the Scotland Act, um, and we're looking at all of that and, and, and the round and how we can take some of that forward. But I think what we want to do this morning as members of the committee is to hear from you um, and to hear where you think there is areas we should we should be targeting and looking at. Um, and in that course, hopefully some of the members will come in with some questions on the back of that. So essentially my question to you is, um, you know, what ideas do you have for where the committee should go with its remit um, and, and how does that tie in with maybe the, the work that your organisation is doing? So I'm looking... Brandy. I'll start off. Um, I'm just going to tell you about three key issues for um, LGBT Scotland. Um, one is education. We want education that includes and reflects LGBT identities with adequate and informative RSHPE, um, as well as work around um, young people's health and well-being outcomes. We also recognize the issue of mental health, particularly for LGBT young people. Um, and what we welcome the mental health strategy um, being um, revised, but what we would really like to see is a stronger focus on equalities and human rights in that strategy. At the moment, there's not a clear recognition of the impact that discrimination can have on mental health. And we know that when um, uh, support for mental health is trying to focus um, on the, someone's experiences but doesn't think about the, the discrimination they're having, that can actually just be a barrier to their, um, sorry, their, their recovery and or their ability to live with that condition. Um, so what we would like to see is we would like to see the committee ask the Scottish Government um, about how they're going to ensure that equalities um, and experiences of discrimination are actually going to be central to um, people's peop uh, treatment plans. but. Um, more visible in the strategy. So we would really like to see that. Um, finally, I'm going to kind of um, tip over to um, James Morton um, from the STA um, to talk a bit more about the Equal Recognition Campaign, but I want to particularly say that um, for LGBT young people at the moment, um, we really want to see non-binary gender recognition and the ability for gender recognition um, for those under 18. Um, and if I can, just bounce it over to James to uh, talk a bit more about the Equal Recognition Campaign. Yes, from a transgender perspective, education and mental health are major issues. Um, but in terms of something that we we hope will will fall across the um, Equality and Human Rights Committee's uh, desk in, in this parliamentary term is uh, reform of the Gender Recognition Act. Um, now, there's three calls we're making. One is about making the process easier and more self-declaration based. So in Ireland, they've moved to a process where just as you can kind of change your name in Scotland with a statute declaration saying, this is who I am, this is how I'm going to live my life and identify, um, they, they now allow you to do that around your gender on your birth certificate too. So we want Scotland to do that. Um, we also want 16 and 17 year olds to be able to change their, their birth certificate gender just as anybody over 18 currently can and under 16s um, where their parents are agreeing that that's in their best interests um, then the, the change in their, on their documents should take place. At the moment you can, you can change your gender under 16 on, on other documents such as your passport. Your parents can apply for a new passport and a new gender but this leaves uh, under 16s with a mismatch of their of their documents. So some will say female, some will say male, um, and, uh, and and this can lead to schools refusing to respect their their gender identity. Um, the third call, and I would say actually by far the most important of the calls, is about recognising non-binary tra trans people. So that's where somebody sees themselves um, and experiences gender as not fitting simply that of being a man or that of being a woman, but instead sees their gender, experiences their gender in a more complicated way and may see themselves as falling between or kind of out with uh, those two terms. And what we're seeing is increasingly younger trans people and indeed trans people of all ages actually are saying, well, why should I have to go and move from female all the way to male or from male all the way to female when actually that's exchanging two different boxes that are uncomfortable in different ways and instead I want to be a human being first and foremost I'd like to remove gender off my documents and simply be seen as a human being legally and um, so that's that's the the kind of key call that we're we're asking for is allowing people to remove the M and the F off their birth certificates um, and uh, that's, that's international best practice. What we're seeing is increasingly different countries. Um, so Australia and New Zealand, um, two states in, in, in America have, have allowed this. And um, there's already sort of a number of, of, of uh, countries in other, in other parts of the world, such as Nepal and Pakistan, um, who, who allow, who allow uh, non-binary recognition. If we can get uh, the, 
Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government to lead the way on this, then that will enable public bodies to take it more seriously. At the moment, non-binary people are generally ignored, even though in terms of numbers, they're probably similar population size to gypsy travellers in Scotland. Uh, that's just seen as, as, as not, not real enough. But actually, you wouldn't say to somebody, you're... Your, your um, religious faith is, is not real enough because you're not Muslim or Christian, you'd recognise that there's a wide diversity and we think that should be the case with gender experiences and identities. Okay, we've got Kayleigh down at the bottom. Kayleigh? Um, for Enable Scotland, um, education is also a, a big priority and, and really, um, whilst I recognise there is an education committee, there is um, a huge issue of equality and human rights um, for people who have learning disabilities and, and their life at school. Um, and that's more in terms of how they're included in, in the school. Um, we have recently engaged in a national conversation on life at school for young people who have learning disabilities and we have had an unprecedented response, which is absolutely telling us that, that this is an urgent issue that, that people want us to be exploring and to be talking about. Um, to give you some of, of the early findings within that, um, more than 60% of, of children who have learning disabilities don't feel part of their life at school. 25% um, of them have been excluded from school trips because it, the support wasn't there to allow them to be part of that. And for me, that's that's an Equality Act issue that's, that's not been explored. Um, and the same, the same with parents who responded, more than half said that their child felt excluded from extracurricular activities at school. Um, I noticed that the committee is going to be, be potentially looking at um, bullying and, and harassment in school. So just to, to highlight that, that um, more than 70% of young people who have learning disabilities feel that, that people in school don't understand them and nearly half of them feel alone at school. Um, so for me, those are part of the education experience, but it's a, it's a huge issue in terms of inclusion, in terms of equality and in terms of human rights. Um, but another major um, issue for, for human rights and is that right to education and actually through our survey, which has had more than 800 responses across parents and families, young people themselves and from um, teachers and educators, 40% of parents told us that their child had been informally excluded from school, which, which shouldn't actually be happening, but we knew anecdotally that it was happening. Um, we now have, have figures to, to prove that. Um, and for 19% for of that, that amount of people, um, that was happening on a weekly basis, that their child was being excluded from education um, due to, we feel, the, the support not being there to, to allow them to, to stay in the classroom and to stay in that school environment. So they're missing out on on their right to education. Um, so for me, education is a huge thing and, and, and does have, have knock-on effects on the, the fact that, that fewer than 10% of, of adults who have learning disabilities are actually in employment just now. And that is a, a continuous cycle in terms of that ongoing isolation um, and, and exclusion from community and from society. So that for me is a, is a huge priority that I'd, I'd love to see explored. Yeah. Right, thanks very much. Kayleigh Tam, do you want to come in at that point? Yeah, I, I first of all want to welcome the addition of human rights to the remit of the committee. Uh, this is a very welcome move and it provides a focal point in terms of human rights considerations for the Parliament. Having said that, I would be wary of all human rights uh, concerns somehow being filtered through this committee because what the committee has a responsibility to do is to make sure that human rights is owned right across all of our committee structures. And I think there's a responsibility to ensure uh, that that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that brings with it uh, a challenge, which is how broad do you draw the remit of uh, the committee? Uh, it's excellent that you've hosted a number of uh, round tables, uh, but I think the example of how many people are around the table with their particular interests and viewpoints to put, all of which are legitimate, creates a challenge for the committee and how it will narrow down its work. Uh, and my particular concern is obviously about children and young people. We are signatories to international treaties, particularly UNCRC, which has just produced its concluding observations, and I would suggest that that's a useful starting point in terms of the work of the committee for children and young people, and in particular, holding the government to account in terms of the actions that it takes as a result of those concluding observations. So there's quite a lot for the committee to sort out, and if I was to give advice, 
I think that the voices of children and young people will help you try to pick your way through what priorities are otherwise you should be looking at. Uh, my office would be quite happy to lend, some, lend whatever assistance in that uh, because what's missing from the table so far mm. has been the voice of, for me, children and young people are people whose human rights are uh, pe people who are living it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got a very long shopping list of things that I would want to, to raise with the committee. <laughs> Uh, if I was to pick one, because I'm respectful of other people to get in, poverty is the most corrosive impact on children's realisation of their rights in Scotland. So it's hard to see past the work of see past the issue of poverty in terms of the work and considerations of the committee. And I would say actually that that goes right the way through for all human rights. Um, and I, I, I will stop there because I think other people will want to have an opportunity to speak. Yeah, Maureen. Uh, thank you for that. I think it's really important that you've mentioned um, young people and poverty and there's certainly evidence that there's poverty among religious minorities and um, that the Muslim Sikh and Roman Catholics are disproportionately likely to live in poverty in Scotland. And some data from the EHRC research um, in the Is Scotland Fairer have mentioned that despite better school performance, ethnic minority, people from ethnic minority backgrounds are twice as likely to be unemployed, twice as likely to be in poverty and in overcrowded and poor housing. Um, people often, they don't necessarily live in the areas of greatest deprivation, um, but despite that, um, we shouldn't think simplistically about that. It's, there still is um, poverty within ethnic minority communities and, like I say, a less likelihood of getting work. Um, some of the poorest income outcomes are for those of Pakistani, Arab and people of Roma descent as well. Um, and I think part of what really needs to be looked at by the committee is that one of the things that I think is very important is the sense that um, every single local authority and of course the Scottish Government as well has a duty to promote good relations and it's how, how do we do this right across schools, local authorities and community groups, what are the structures that are in place to promote good relations um, between all, you know, all the different um, faith communities but other communities as well. And I think it's, it, it sounds such a positive thing to have that as part of the equality duty to promote good relations. But the thing is, what are the structures to do that? How do we promote good relations? Rather than just having it as a, a tick box that we want good relations, we have to have things in place. Um, education has been mentioned by a number of people, and I think it's the religious and moral education system in the Scottish schools, I think, is, is failing in some way. 40 minutes a week to really look at you know, re religion, you know, the diversity of religion in Scotland and promoting good relations is probably just not adequate. Um, the sense also that, that quite often this subject is just given to another teacher to do. You know, even they're not getting full training to deliver this well and thoughtfully and sensitively taking into consideration just that incredible diversity of religions that are out there. So the maths teacher might be told, you know, you take religious and moral education for 40 minutes a week. And you can imagine a biology teacher being asked to do the, you know, to take the maths <laughs> class and, and think that that would be adequate. So last night we had um, a dialogue on religion and human rights with our stakeholders, and this came up regularly that there just wasn't adequate education. And really to have good relations, we have to start with the very young and really promoting that in our schools, across our local authorities and across you know, all, all our organisations really. So something that really looks at the promotion of good relations would be helpful. Yeah, excellent, thank you. thank you. And many many of the aspects that we've spoken about in regards to children also affect our older people's groups as well and that's a good time for you to come in, Glenda. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed. Um, picking up on Branda Lee's point about mental health and young people, there's certainly an issue um, for older people. And I'm not speaking about dementia, I'm speaking about older people who have depression, anxiety, who probably have long-term conditions as well associated with mental health problems. We've been doing some work with Action in Mind and Age in Mind, and they've um, consulted with quite a lot of older people with mental health problems, and they're telling us that they're not getting access to psychological and therapeutic services. Um, there's a, 
um, a reduction in services across the board in terms of health and social care. And generally, people are finding it very difficult to access services. But um, for people with mental health problems, I think it is a, a big problem. Um, some of the stories that we've heard about are, are really quite sad. Um, some people who've been on long-term medication, um, which is beginning to affect their physical being, having effects on their kidney and, and their other systems. And, and, of course, they're looking to explain this, um, this condition to medical people, but they're not understood, they're not believed. So, so behind this, the, we're beginning to get a feeling of ageism, and people not really taking into account that you get older, you still need to have somebody to speak to, somebody to listen to. Um, I was at an event last night uh, run by the Royal College of Nursing, and we heard a counsellor speaking about meeting up with older people in their 80s and 90s who so benefited from some counselling and therapeutic interaction. People who were speaking about wanting to come to the end of their life with some peace, and needing a chance to speak about it. So that's one of the issues that we're concerned about. Another one links into poverty as well. Um, there are about 120,000 older people um, who are in poverty in Scotland. This is very sad. And uh, I, we know that there are many people who do not take up their benefits. And I know from the launch of the Fairer Scotland Conversation and Action Plan yesterday, there's going to be some actions to improve this. So that, that's most welcome. But um, there is a real divide between people who have and people who have not, whether they're old or whether they're young. And this gap is getting bigger and bigger. And we really must be doing something about this. Yeah. And I think that probably requires a kind of major structural change. <laughs> thank you. Th thanks very much, Judith. Um, thank you, uh, Christina. Um, I'm really keen to sort of set this conversation in the context of what also is happening externally because, uh, and really welcoming as Tam has, the, the, the incorporation of human rights into the remit of the committee, um, because the wider discussion around human rights in the UK is not a particularly progressive one at the moment and the one that is, 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 is threatening to claw back um, uh, potential rights um, that we afford our citizens. Um, and I think that, from my perspective, presents a major opportunity in Scotland to make to, to do something differently and for this committee to play a role in shining a different light on human rights in Scotland and shining a light that is progressive, is moving that agenda forward in, in our society. All the issues that people, in fact, maybe not all, but a lot of the issues people are talking about here, um, many of them come under what would be deemed the covenant of economic, social and cultural rights. And the, the framing of our rights within that context um, is, is something that is seldom done. Um, it, again, it's a role that the committee can have. It's a role that the Scottish Government has said they're interested in, in understanding more, progressing more and looking at. And what we don't have in Scotland is any kind of backstop of protection to enable a rights-based approach to actually helping people access their rights in some in many of the issues that people have been talking about just now. And from, from the perspective of the Human Rights Commission, incorporation of the Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights would actually progressively move the terms of that debate into a very different place in Scotland. It would mean that people themselves could access um, some kind of redress when their rights are not are, are, are not established, um, but also it would provide a, a context whereby our legislative processes were proactively bringing into their, their mindset um, economic and social cultural rights when legislation is planned, is designed, is set, and the, the kind of terms of the debate around those rights in Scotland would, 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 would be very different. Now, that's a, that's a that's something that, through our international obligations uh, to the human rights treaties, we are signed up to do. Um, Tam's already referred to the concluding observations, um, the concluding observations of the, um, the Committee on Economic and Social Cultural Rights <coughs> makes the point that both the, the UK government and the, the Scottish Parliament, Scottish government, haven't fully incorporated those rights into, into Scottish law. And that would be it's clearly not, it, that would be something that the, d the committee deliberating on, reflecting on, and, and advocating potentially on behalf of would be would be not just an important thing to do in order to meet the, 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 our own international obligations, which clearly is is important, but um, actually challenge the terms of the debate going on in the wider context in the UK. 
Yes, a lot of the, the information and ideas we've got from many of the groups have, have directed us towards the UN concluding observations and, and we're looking forward to working with you on how do we extract the ones that are relevant to Scotland and we, we can t do that t t going forward. Can I maybe just focus a wee bit on women's issues because I'm, I'm conscious that we, we've got a wee conclave down there um, um, of uh, some of the, the the areas and ideas that I have worked with over the years with many of you on, on some of these. But it, it gives another perspective to the rights agenda and, and how it affects discrete groups. And, and, for, and for your point, Rosalind and, and Anne, Anna, the, the issues around women. Um, Rosalind, if you want. Yes, thanks very much. Um, for maternity rights, uh, I think one of the really big issues at the moment is maternity rights in employment. And there's been research by the EHRC released earlier this year showing that three quarters of pregnant women and new mothers in the workplace experience some form of discrimination and one in nine lose their job as a result of discrimination either by being sacked or feeling compelled to leave their job. Uh, and in Scotland that means 5,000 women a year um, who lose their jobs as a result of pregnancy discrimination. There's no problem with the law. The law is very clear. It's just not being complied with. There's been some very welcome initiatives from the Scottish Government on this, which I think is fantastic in sort of starting to address the problem, but it is quite a large scale problem. One in 25 uh, pregnant women and new mothers leave their job because of health and safety concerns. And I think it would be particularly useful actually if this committee was interested in pursuing that, because I think that's an area where there's some quite concrete work that could be done to document practice and look at strategies uh, to Im improve practice. Uh, a second issue what we would be encouraging the committee to look at is around access to maternity care for vulnerable migrant women. These are the women who have the highest rates of maternal morbidity and mortality, um, and yet there are quite significant barriers for them to access their NHS maternity care. Uh, some of these sit with uh, midwives and maternity services, but others actually sit outside um, the immediate remit of the maternity services. The practice of charging for NHS maternity care uh, affects quite a number of very vulnerable groups, and these, as I said, are groups with very high uh, maternal mortality and morbidity. Uh, and alongside that, I think some of the practices of the Home Office in its asylum support system, particularly the practice of dispersal or forced relocation, can uh, have a quite concrete effect on women's ability to access uh, maternity care or con continuity of care. Uh, and I think that would be a useful one to explore. Yep. Anna. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd just like to draw attention to a couple of issues and would certainly agree with others who've mentioned poverty. Um, certainly women's higher levels of poverty are something that um, are intrinsic to our work where two thirds of those um, earning below the living wage are women and women's employment is, of course, concentrated in low-paid jobs and sectors. Um, the, I suppose looking at women's employment in general, we've got particular concerns about the public sector equality duty and I understand from discussions this morning that that's been raised in other meetings as well. In particular, we do a lot of work on the gender and employment aspects of the duties, whereby public authorities are required to publish information on e equal pay, on the pay gap, on occupational segregation. But the work that we've done, which has taken the form of assessment, um, bits of assessment work and focus groups, shows that overall it's failing. And from 2013 to 2015, we've seen a regression. And in 2013, we'd already seen a regression from the gender equality duty um, before that. So we do have significant concerns about um, the lack of progress in reducing pay gaps and reducing occupational segregation across the uh, public sector. And we'd point out also that um, the gathering and using of data on pregnancy and maternity is um, extremely lacking, whereby the vast majority of the organisations that we looked at in the sample of our work weren't collecting any data on pregnancy and maternity. So um, I suppose we would question whether or not the, uh, if the, the findings of assessment works and compliance work done by the EHRC in April 2017 make similar conclusions in that the sector overall um, is not performing as it, it should do in making progress, then we would welcome a review to look at the regulation again to see how it can better realise um, change for women. 
In the private sector, we're particularly interested in the Scottish Government um, Business Pledge initiative, um, although do have uh, some concerns about the very small number of companies that have signed up to uh, take action to advance gender equality. Um, we uh, understand it's a voluntary initiative as well, but um, have concerns that the the organisation that is administering it, Scottish Enterprise and also Highlands and Isles Enterprise, lacks the gender competence or the understanding in order to um, effectively influence account management companies who are often the target of signing up to such schemes. Um, and related to that, I suppose one of our key asks would be to look at the account management function uh, in, in general of the... Um, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise and how conditionality can be attached to public money that's been spent in providing support for businesses who and how they can better engage in the equalities agenda. Skills Development Scotland um, are already taking tentative steps to um, include conditionality to funding provided to training providers for them to um, demonstrate how they are advancing equality. And we think that there should be more accountability in terms of the public funding that is spent by Scottish Enterprise in giving it out to companies and the responsibilities of companies in receipt of public funding to advance equalities. Very, <laughs> very, very. I don't know, uh, Lorraine, if Audit Scotland have, have done any analysis on this and maybe that's where we should look at next, yeah. Um, I actually don't know, and that's, that's because I'm a fairly new girl to Audit Scotland. Um, but I would, so there are some things that I think it's important to say, though, at this point. Um, I think that, um, so Audit Scotland has a rolling work programme. We've got a work programme set for the next five years. First two years are fairly set in stone, but there is an opportunity to influence what's in our uh, work programme for the few years after that. Um, and I think that as an organisation, we're very keen to have dialogue with equalities groups on what sorts of things do we need to be taken account of when we're one auditing and what lens we're looking through and also when we're looking at you know what sorts of things are on our uh, work programme. Um, so, for example, I'm sort of looking at our work programme just now and it's available um, on the internet. Some of the things that we've got that we want to look at in the next few years, I think it would be of interest to an awful lot of folks around this room, including things like mental health, early learning and childcare, um, community empowerment, self-directed support. And I was having a, a conversation with James just earlier on about you know, self-directed support and needing to really understand what are some of the equalities issues around some of that. Um, so I think from our perspective, yes, there's, there's a lot we can do through use of data and triangulation of evidence, but I think what we're very keen to do is to get past some of that process and speak to people and have some dialogues with the qualities groups, the qualities organisations in a different way, perhaps, than we have. Um, also, um, we'd be very keen to work alongside the committee in terms of looking at our work programme and seeing if there's anything in it that, that would be of kind of mutual benefit, mutual advantage, and I'm happy to, to have that discussion. While I've got the mic, <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to make a, a, a bit of a plea. Um, we, we have invited a range of uh, groups and organisations to a roundtable discussion we're having internally tomorrow. And I'm aware that some people are, are going to manage to come. And I'm also aware, shamefully, that we have missed some people out. So um, we are having a roundtable discussion in Audit Scotland in 102 Westport tomorrow with a range of equalities groups because we want to understand how, so how we can have a dialogue um, so that we can include that dialogue in some of the audit work that we do. So, sorry, I'm making a, a shameless plug here. <laughs> if, I, if, if I've asked you to come, please come. If you can't come, please send someone to come. And if I haven't asked you, please grab me at the end of this discussion. <laughs> Excellent. I think the more of the collaborative work that we do, the better. Um, happy for you to take your shameless plug. Um, Lorraine Cook, I was just wondering whether this would be a good opportunity for you to come in to talk about where COSLA is in all of this. Yep. Um, in terms of public sector equality duties, there, there has been a lot of discussion in past evidence sessions as well. And we would agree and we welcomed EHRC's um, comments on a review of the public sector equality duties, um, and really a, a review of what is and is not working, um, focusing on um, the results, the impact on communities, rather than, and, and from some public bodies are saying, an overly bureaucratic process, and the focus is on that bureaucratic process. Um, and also, in terms of what is and is not working, in terms of the English-centric um, structure and focus of the public sector equality duties, um, there's mention of 
education authorities, um, licensing boards, as if they're all separate bodies. Um, when a, they're one of the same local authority, and why should there be reports for different? So different aspects, we would wholeheartedly um, support our view of the public sector equality duties. Going back to poverty as well, we have supported um, the devolved powers of the socio-economic duty um, since our, our Smith response, um, and really teasing out what do, what does that look like, and what that what will that involve. Um, producing guidance um, around it um, and just really getting uh, also involving public bodies and wider um, communities involved in that guidance and what should it look like and getting the best out of it in terms of tackling poverty. Um, also, James, pick, um, James was talking about non-binary and I Took, I said I was giving evidence um, to the committee and I took it back to our local authorities through the um, Scottish Council's Equalities Network. And that was one of the issues that they, that they raised in terms of children that identify as non-binary um, and the transition um, to the job market and the difficulties and barriers they are, they are coming up with in terms of as simple as getting their national insurance number and the, the bureaucratic um, processes that, that are not recognising them. Um, so that was raised by equality officers and there was a lot of discussion around that and a, a lot of acknowledgement um, of, of that around the table. Um, also, we were, um, we were talking about, uh, there, there, there's a loose link with Glenda talking about health and social care, but also we've been doing, as I sit in the migration population diversity team, been looking a lot at Brexit um, and the impact of Brexit on um, local communities um, and local authorities and in terms of EU nationals and their rights to live and work in Scotland and their growing concerns that they are voicing to local authorities of where is their place in Scotland and their right to work in Scotland. And in terms of, for local authorities, the impact that this will have, uh, potentially, I mean, nobody, nobody knows at the moment um, what we're going to get, soft, hard Brexit in terms of freedom of movement, but the, the way it's going. Um, and also how that will impact in terms of the benefits that these people bring, in terms of the benefits in terms of um, demographics. Less, um, around half of local authorities are looking at population. How can they grow their population? And EU nationals, um, their families are key to this. Um, also in terms of the benefits they bring economic um, and the economic impacts this potentially could have. Health and social care, from the feedback we're getting from local authorities, this is, would have huge impact on the workforce um, of health and social care. Um, but, but it's across the board. It's um, agricultural sector. It's, we're hearing it from um, companies, local companies, um, within different um, local authorities. We, we, we've had lists of companies that this could impact on hugely. Um, and very much community community cohesion. Also, we're looking at a range of skills, teachers as well, education sector as well. Um, but really in terms of community cohesion um, and, and the rights of these people, these EU nationals, in terms of being able to live and work um, and promoting the benefits that they bring um, to Scotland. Yep, sorry, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I mean, I think you, you, you've touched on a, a topic, I think, it is, is in everybody's mind right now about how how things may change and the impact that will then have on on, on people. And I think, Suzanne, I, I knew, actually knew that you'd be, you would be wanting to come in on this because I know that you've got some uh, quite interesting and strong views on this, Suzanne. I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, starting off, we, we have two main asks of the committee. Um, the first one is to um, ask for a continuing focus on the lives and experience of gypsy travellers within Scotland. I think with the publication of the recent Scottish Social Attitudes Survey, you will see from that that gypsy travellers continued to be amongst the most marginalised but also demonised populations within Scotland. And despite two very welcome previous inquiries by the committee, we have seen very, very little progress, which actually 
directly impacts and improves on the lives of gypsy travellers. And I think one of our particular concerns is the ongoing refusal of local authorities to build sites for gypsy travellers, which then force them into a range of other circumstances, which then obviously impact on the settled population. And I think it goes to um, what a colleague over there was saying about community cohesion. So that's one of the, the issues we would welcome a continuing focus on. The second one isn't new again, but it's to ask for, um, again, a continuing focus on equalities, evidence and data collection. And I know that with the publication of the, the Fairer Scotland Action Plan yesterday, I think it's Commitment 13, where there is a commitment to implement the race equality strategy and equalities ev evidence gathering is part of that. But I would remind the committee that, you know, since the Equality Act in 2010, there's been a requirement to collect that data. And we know that um, practice across the country is, is very patchy. There are some examples of good practice, but it's not uniform. And I think our concern would be that whilst we have um, robust information on poverty within Scotland, it's not matched by equalities data. So the danger for us is that a lot of policy is driven by poverty data, poverty indicators, and the balance is, you know, is going too far in, 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 in one direction. So it's not to say poverty isn't important, it absolutely is, but we still need to get um, the, the evidence gathering, the data gathering on equalities. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's some good, good, good advice there. I'm, I'm very conscious that we've not dealt with some of the, the other barriers that people face, uh, and, and I think maybe I'll come to you, Gozi, first, um, <coughs> from the point of view of, of the barriers that maybe some of the people that you work with would face, sure. and we'll come back to Sandra and Chloe after that, yeah? Okay, so um, I work for RNIB Scotland, and my remit is broadly around prevention of avoidable site loss, with a focus on particular groups who are at greater risk. Um, generally groups in, in high deprivation, certain ethnic groups, people living with a learning disability um, are all defined by um, our, our organisation as at risk. There are roughly 188,000 people living with significant sight loss in Scotland. Every day, roughly 10 people are diagnosed with um, significant sight loss in a, an eye clinic. We feel there's a really strong link between uh, um, sight loss diagnosis and mental health and the p potential for depression and isolation is significantly higher um, in this group of patients. One of the services that we offer in particular eye clinics is a vision support service, which is essentially a member of staff who sits within the clinic or close to the clinic and can take ba basically some of the burden, emotional and practical um, queries um, of people who are newly diagnosed. And we've applied this to roughly 40% of eye clinics across Scotland. Um, and we'd like to see that number broadened out um, in order to catch people at that early stage and give them support. The other point that was made um, quite prolifically has been around um, poverty. And we believe that there is definitely the potential for an increasing eye health inequality in Scotland especially given the increase in our diversity in the population and the growing, um, pop, uh, the growing demograph of an older um, member of, of the Scottish community. We have a little evidence to show that there is actually an increasing eye health inequality, despite the eye exam in Scotland being free for the past 10 years. The uptake seems to be increasing amongst those in higher economic brackets compared to those in lower. And that, for us, indicates you know, a potential time bomb in terms of how we manage to treat and effectively deliver social care services um, to people in the lowest edge of society. Is there any reason for that? Have you got any detail on the reasons for that? Is it, is it people are, are maybe not going for the site test because they then can't afford the, the equipment they would need after it? Is that...? There's some anecdotal evidence to say that the, 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 the environment of the community optometrist creates a perception that you have to spend money when you're in that particular environment. Now, we've had this conversation with Optometry Scotland to, to quite a large extent. I think they acknowledge that that is a potential barrier. 
But there are a whole range of other barriers as well, and I think deprivation just brings with it, you know, ill health and the potential um, for, you know, a range of different conditions and lifestyle patterns that just mean that preventative um, life um, health seeking approaches aren't a high priority um, for certain members of society. So that's something that we have to, I suppose, get some kind of greater understanding of. Um, the, the third area that I would speak about is um, digital inclusion. We, also, we obviously have a very strong um, policy and drive and momentum in Scotland around digital inclusion. Again, I think it's important to realise that people with sight loss, particularly in rural areas, are somehow being left behind um, in this particular um, movement. RNIB, uh, along with the partners, have been um, granted three years funding by Big Lottery to upskill a number of um, 10,500 people across the UK with sight loss um, in how to use accessible uh, smart technology. However, the costs of these pieces of technology and again, the sort of inconsistent network coverage across Scotland makes it really difficult for people to uptake these particular um, lifestyle enhancing technologies. So we would ask that the Scottish Government keeps this on their radar. Glenda, did you want to come in on a particular point? Um, yeah. See, thank you, really just to support what Gozi is saying about um, older people. Um, um, Highland Senior <laughs> Citizens Network had been tracking um, the, waiting, the, the growing waiting list for older people to have cataract operations, and, um, and this is really uh, causing a lot of concern. So a letter was written to the, minister, the health minister, Shona Robertson, and um, it's been discovered that not only is this a problem in Highland, but in other local authority health board areas as well. So the waiting list for cataract operations is on the increase. And then there was something in the paper about, uh, I think it was in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago, so it seems to be a kind of national problem. But the point is, if we're looking to prevent people from being, or to, to help people to be as independent as possible as they grow old, then these are the kind of issues that need to be addressed quickly. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah, that, and also I think, you know, that just um, the whole concept of... Um, health and social care integration, I think, really has to start shifting some real focus on preventative approaches um, so that we can anticipate, A, who our at-risk groups are, have targeted public health you know, sort of input with regards to the likes of sight loss issues. I think that would be a, a, a good starting point for health and social care integration. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> We're getting lots and lots of work to do. Um, th thank you so, so much for that. Um, Sandra, you, you've, there's a particular aspect to the work that you do that, that again, gives us a different dynamic on, on the work that we need to do. I'm afraid I'm only going to give you more work. <laughs> <laughs> We're up for it. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we'd love for um, the committee to focus on is um, this is in particular to the police service, but also the other public... Um, public service bodies. Um, it's the it's the use of uh, positive action. Um, if we are in particular in the police, we're talking about um, having a di diverse, inclusive workforce, one that reflects the community that we serve. It's important that we we not only monitor the usage and um, the extent, and most importantly, the success of positive action initiatives. And, um, and a lot of times we talk about it, but we don't put the resources behind it. And um, if we are committing to the outcome, you know what I mean? It's something that you as a committee should perhaps monitor. I think. The other thing was about um, retention strategies. Um, big thing for the police is about retaining the minority ethnic um, officers and staff that we've got. But it's... Um, it's not only that about conducting meaningful exit interviews and, and informing um, management about you know where we're failing, where we're not, but it's and it's not only in the pol in the police. It's general public sector, and it's something that you your committee might want to to inquire about and stuff. And thirdly, was um, about the inquiry in public sector equalities duty. 
mainly, again, how robust is this data collection and performance indicators? It just seems like, in some instance, a tick box and because nobody follows it up. Um, and um, you know, nobody evaluates what anybody gives them. So it's, it's to some people, just a paper exercise that it, time has come to either drop it or take it very seriously. And we are, we'd be delighted to work with Eric on this. <laughs> <laughs> One of the key themes that's come through from all of the evidence we've taken over the past few weeks is, is the user quality impact assessments and how, how well they are done and, and the impact that then has on how well strategies and policies are put in place. So uh, I think it's a thread of work that we've certainly um, has been knitted through everything that, that we understand needs to be done and the quality impact assessments is a huge part of that decent data collection yes. and everything. Chloe. Thank you. Um, so about a year ago, the Church of Scotland decided to ask people in churches and in the communities that churches serve um, what they thought the priorities for the work of the church should be. We called the Speak Out 10,000 Voices for Change. So we set the optimistic target of hearing from 10,000 people. And in fact, we heard from nearly 11,000 people in the course of like, six months, the end of last year. We asked people to imagine that it's 2035 and that Scotland is a fairer, more equal and more just society in a fairer, more equal and just world. And what one thing should the church do to make that happen? If you're familiar with Fairer Scotland, it might sound quite similar. <laughs> I had a number of conversations as we went along about that. And there were two overriding issues that came out of that when we analysed it. The first one was about relationships, which echoes very much what other people here have said. A lot of people who replied to our question told us that a cause of injustice and inequality was, was relationships and that we needed to ensure that relationships were better. And that was a way of solving some of the issues they were experiencing. The other overwhelming issue that we heard was the need to tackle poverty and, and systemic injustice. And all of the work that we'll be doing going forward will be in, in the context of relationships and tackling poverty and injustice within our systems. And within that, we have seven themes. And at the moment, we're developing a work plan um, which will last for around 10 years to try and address some quite big issues in our themes. So our themes are building local communities where people flourish, doing politics differently, which is about participation and engagement, investing in our young people, which will include education but not be limited to education. Ensuring health and well-being for all, caring for creation, building global friendships and creating an economy driven by equality. And I think it would be interesting to talk to, to anyone around the table about some of the detail in there because that's very much where we are now is in what actual practical actions would we take and also in what practical actions could we take with others so I think we'd be very interested in the committee's developing work plan and whether there's any, any work we could do with you. And I think the other thing, just picking up what's been said around the table, is about human rights. Um, we very much think that is a, is a core issue in all the things that we're doing. We'd be very keen to work on how Scotland could take that human rights agenda forward, particularly around social economic duty. That's a, also a priority area for us. Excellent. Alex? Thank you, Convener, and thank you very much to all our panellists for some very fulsome presentations. I think we, we really do have our work cut out for us. Um, I'm very struck by an emerging theme that cut across several presentations this morning, and that is uh, access to justice, um, particularly in Rosalind's remarks about uh, maternity rights and the number of people who are dismissed for um, maternity reasons uh, from workplace in Scotland and other themes coming out of other presentations around but the similar uh, lack of access to justice. And I, I'm struck by the, the view that if we're to make rights real, um, that's a big problem. And coming as I do from the children's sector, and I declare an interest having been previous convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights, that um, the failure for Scotland to incorporate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child means that children don't have access to justice in that respect. I just wanted to throw it open to see what are the other barriers um, which m make that access to justice so difficult um, and whether that's uh, things for this parliament to take on in terms of in certain incorporation of certain treaties or if, it, if there are wider practical issues to that. Rosalind. <coughs> Yes, I think it's really useful to have that, that issue so clearly put. It is uh, one thing to have rights on paper, it's a very different thing to have rights in practice. So what needs to be done to be able to make sure that individuals can exercise their rights? 
certainly for uh, uh, pregnant women and new mothers in the workplace, and indeed their, par their partners, um, lack of information is definitely a factor. Uh, lack of access to advice services, so someone who can talk to you about your situation and advise you on what to do, um, and assistance to actually take forward a grievance or so on. I think most cases will be resolved before you reach the tribunal. Um, but at the moment, only 8% of women who experience discrimination even raise a grievance. So we're dealing with um, uh, interventions that are needed even before the point where you're even considering a tribunal. So I do think this this point where we're looking at the sort of um, practical advice and support that we can give to women and their partners is, is the critical thing for pregnant women and new mothers. Yeah, um, Maureen, I think you were going to come in there, weren't you? Yes, just on um, issues of justice. Um, most people will be aware of the rise in hate crime, um, and particularly against the Muslim community <laughs> and um, the Jewish community as well, to, to a degree. And I think in terms of people accessing um, justice, fear comes into it. I think if you're a victim of hate crime and if you're perceived um, uh, as... as a target for, for hate crime. It's 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 quite frightening to come forward and actually then access your um you know your your protections really. So just that it, again, people are probably aware that next week is Hate Crime Awareness Week, and Police Scotland uh, will be with us at Interface Scotland on Monday. Um, you know, doing um, awareness raising in terms of just hate crime. So something about being aware of what causes hate crimes, who are the targets of hate crimes, what can someone do through third party reporting if they don't want to go directly to the police, what can be done when they are, when people are a target of hate crime, um, and certainly within the, the minority faith communities. And the Sikh community are also impacted by that just because of people's perceptions, you know, men wearing a turban, etc. they're perceived as Muslims, so um, this rise in Islamophobia and it links in as well, I think, to the sense that Scotland has to remain a very outward looking um, and have a global perspective. Because when international things happen to communities abroad, they impact very directly here. So, you know, terrorist attacks abroad impact on the faith communities and, and others here. And um, so there's this, we're, we don't exist in isolation, so that all that you consider in terms of equality and human rights should also be within a sort of global framework to really think um, how how are things that are happening internationally impacting on our communities locally. I think that's quite important. Tom. Yeah. I mean, of course we want this committee to press for the incorporation of our international obligations. Uh, and Judas already uh, indicated along those lines. So yes, in the longer term. In the short term, there's a role for this committee in terms of the threat to the Human Rights Act. And therefore, I think that this committee can actually act as a bulwark to some of the developments uh, in other parts of the UK. So that's really important. Uh, and I think that will become important work for the committee. Uh, in terms of specific access to justice, then there are issues with regard to legal aid, and particularly children's mm -hmm. access to legal aid. So that's a helpful reminder. And if I can return to my list. <laughs> um, but we're still allowed to hit our children in Scotland. And that puts us to shame in the rest of Europe. So there has to be something that we look at in terms of equal protection. We still have the lowest age of criminal responsibility, despite the efforts of the government to take consultation on it. And I would want this committee to keep a watchful brief on raising the age of criminal responsibility. We still have children, women and children suffering as a result of the incidence of domestic abuse. And that's an infringement of their rights. And again, I would want this committee to take that a serious matter. And it's already been mentioned about the mental health of children and young people, indeed the whole of our population, uh, and particular issues with regard to children with disabilities. And I should say, in terms of families, of refugee families, then there's a growing problem of families who don't have, who've got no recourse to public funds. Uh, and that may well become a matter of increasing concern. I think that's me finished my list. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Judith. I suppose I just wanted to reiterate the point um, in relation to access to justice. If we do not have the backstop of the, the protections that, that something like incorporation of ASC rights uh, provide, then there is no chance for people living in poverty. Um, to, to, there, there's, there's no route through to get access to the justice that those protections might afford. At the moment, that doesn't exist. If we were to genuinely map um, what happens to someone living in poverty in relation to their rights and how they might access justice in relation to that, we would find very many barriers in, 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 in the way of them gaining access to their rights um, at, at, at so many levels. So if, if we did map that and actually looked at what are the protections that are afforded along that journey, and then how discrimination comes into play in the, in, the, in, the, in the play out of some of those routes which are available to people. It's not that there are none, um, but, but discrimination plays a significant role in enabling people to, to equally access justice, um, whether that be justice via a, a, a financial route or, or just prejudice when they're met within the court system, within the police system, within the different um, uh, vehicles that people currently have. Um, even within the complaints mechanisms, which is the kind of initial line of act of, of justice being provided uh, around some of the issues we've been talking about today, the capacity and ability of people to use those routes to get their complaint even assessed um, can be can be limited. So, how, as you as Rosalind described in, in relation to advocacy support for people to take those routes. Um, Citizens Advice Bureaus, for example, which do amazing work in communities, um, but the resources, that the, the reliability and the resources and the, the capacity that they have to do that in an, in an increasing con a context where need and demand is increasing, I think is something which requires serious consideration. So there's a whole landscape around access to justice from the, you know, right to the end where you you really don't want to be around justiciability and actually court cases um, uh, to the, the, the kind of complaint mechanisms and how accessible they are, how quick are they, how much remedy do they provide and how much change does it actually get on the, on the, on the behalf of the, the person who's experiencing whatever kind of grievance they have. So that's a difficult landscape and I want to set it in a context of a white, what I think is a wider issue, which is something I, I saw when I worked for Oxfam as I previously, but almost a systemic reluctance to absorb and acknowledge accountability and to really understand that as, as not just public authorities but as all kinds of authorities, we have an accountability to the people whose lives we are trying to um, provide services to or to improve. We systematically weaken the accountability structures, particularly as they go through legislative processes. I've seen it time and time again and we would see it within the, the um, the incorporation of the rights of the child. We seem to be very cautious. We're risk averse when it comes to building in accountability structures which, can gen which genuinely enable people to access those kind of processes in a way which delivers for them fairly, equitably and accessibly. And so I think, I think we need to think about that, reflect on what accountability really means. It's something that the UN particularly has got very strong messages on. It's done a lot of work to understand. It's done a lot of work to invest, to really look at how state legislatures and state states can build accountability into their systems to enable people to access those justice processes. And so, so there's an attitudinal piece around accountability, which I think would be, would be really across all these pieces, um, which I think would be really uh, beneficial to, to, to tackle change, understand and transform. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a really good piece of advice, actually. Suzanne, you wanted to end it and I've got brandy and we've only got five minutes left and I've got to get Willie Coffee in as well. So I'll be very quick. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to do what Tam did and just come back to my shopping list. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but with my carers hat on, I mean, we were absolutely delighted with the passing of the, the Carers Act, um, which will come into being on the 1st of April 2018. Also delighted to have worked with Parliament and Government on achieving essentially um, an equalities clause on the face of the Act. 
But my ask is in relation to perhaps towards the end of this committee's program of work that there's an opportunity to look at the impact of actually having that clause within legislation. Because when you go back to the census, both in terms of the 2001 and 2011 census, which is already five years out of date, but what we have seen is a doubling in the number of carers within minority ethnic populations. But it also goes back to an earlier point in that we have very limited, if any, data on carers within LGBT communities, carers who have a disability or a long-term condition themselves. So there are evidence and information gaps as well, which may, and, and the equalities clause may be a route to getting that information, but it, I suppose picking up on the accountability, having an opportunity to see what the impact is further down the line. I'm sure it's something we would all be interested in, actually, as a piece of work like that. Brandy. I'll be very brief. Um, just picking up on um, Tam's point about children's rights, um, and I'm in relation to the Equality Act in particular, um, young people are not protected from harassment from their peers um, in schools. That's an issue. Um, going back to the idea of domestic abuse, um, an issue that's particular for LGBT people, um, in addition to the barrier of not being aware, not having access to know how to go about to reporting, there can be a fear um, that if someone reports um, that they will be outed in court effectively because um, courts are open and if they go um, and they go and talk about their relationship or the abuse they're experiencing, that experience can be shared and that can be a very large barrier for LGBT people. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Billy Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. And again, I'd like to echo the comments of my colleague Alec there and thanking everybody for the range of the wonderful contributions that have been made today. And it, and it gives us a huge problem, Convener, doesn't it? I uh, suppose that's an understatement. But what, what I'm so proud of, uh, that the Scottish Parliament at least will be and will remain to be a champion of human rights. And that's in stark contrast, I think, to events elsewhere. And, and one of Tam's uh, list, many items in his list, and the domestic abuse issue that you mentioned there, there's a bill coming through this parliament to tackle that time. So the, our hope is it, that we'll be able to address some of those concerns there. But convener, I sometimes think, where will we be in five years' time? And it's a long time we have to look at many of these issues. Where will we be and how will we judge if we've made any progress in all of this? And I, and I think to myself, as I'm listening to everyone, what are the kind of key drivers that might influence change and, and improvement in all of these areas? Is it tackling poverty? And I've heard it mentioned by a number of colleagues around the table. Is it, is it education inequalities? Is it mental health issues? So I'm thinking, Convener, trying to help the committee here, how will we try to gather some of the key drivers, perhaps, that will help all of these agendas to move forward? And colleagues, you will be the judge of, of whether and how successful we are at something like this over the, the coming five years of this term of the Parliament. But I'm very much looking forward to the opportunity and the chance to continue and participate in that agenda with you. Has anybody got an idea what the key drivers would be, Tam? I, I think, I think. I mean, there's been lots of really powerful presentations. Themes have come up, things like poverty, things like incorporation, making sure that people have got access to justice. I think one of the key things for the committee is to try and make the link between people who are living in communities and human rights, so that everybody feels a sense that this matters to them, because it does. And if you get that message across, then we'll be in a better place in five years' time. Excellent. Right on time. Now, is there anything we've absolutely missed? Lorraine, did you want to come in quickly? Um, I, I would just probably draw attention to the Community Impairment Act. I think we've got a really good piece of legislation um, to work on. I think it's a really good starting point. So, so I don't think we've really talked an awful lot about what that might bring. The other thing I, I would want to say is I'd be very keen to look at what role audit and scrutiny has in terms of a driver for change. Um, I think that's something Audit Scotland are quite keen to, to start having discussions on. I think we're, we're, we're very aware you know, that audit does have an impact on how public services are delivered. And I think if we're quite keen to be involved in the process of better public services, I think there's definitely a discussion to be had about you know, how, we, how we understand the experience that people are having and how we understand the impact of public services has on people, and it, as well as the usual audit methodologies that we have to use. Excellent. That's a good, good push in the right direction. I've glenned up really quickly and then I'm going to go and it in. Yes, just very quickly. And it really follows on from Lorraine. And it's about connection to the other committees within Parliament, because <laughs> other committees are covering many of the issues that we've raised today. And I know that reports are there. So I guess if the synergy 
between that would be doing a lot of work. The Clark and teams are doing a lot of work in making sure that, that we complement rather than, than duplicate across committees. So there's a bit of work going on there already, Glenda. Linda Fabiani, the final yeah, word. Just very, very quickly, because I'm aware I'm, a, I'm an interloper. But, <laughs> but uh, I have to say that I found it absolutely fascinating. And just to pick up on the last three points by um, two points, Tam and Lorraine, and relating back to Judith's point, I think one of the things that underpins all of this is, I think, what uh, Judith called the attitudinal aspect, accountability. And we can talk about all these things all we like, but until people really understand what we're talking about, until people are accountable to make sure these things happen, we won't really get anywhere. And the accountability aspect means that people will start to understand human rights better and not just see it as some kind of airy fairy thing that doesn't really affect them day to day. So, so thank you for all of that, everyone. For an interloper, a fantastic <laughs> final point, actually. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can I thank you all this morning for, for your evidence? This is not the end of our process together. This is just to start. I'm hoping that we're all going to work together on all of these aspects. There's many interests within the, the MSP group in the committee on all of the areas that we've covered this morning. And we're really looking forward to, to, to pushing all the agendas forward as, as far as we can and being a bit more radical about what we do here as well. So thank you so much for your uh, interaction with us this morning. If you go away and you think I should have said this, please write to us and let us know. Um, Tam, you can send us your longer shopping list. Um, but I'm going, to I'm going to suspend the committee now to allow us to go into private and allow you all to, to, to get out the, the, the room. Well, thank you.